The last step in relaxing memory orderings that we will consider is release consistency. The difference between weak ordering and release consistency is that in weak ordering there is only one synchronization operation, and that has to serve for entering a critical section and exiting it. So that means that the actions appropriate to both need to be taken every time there is a synchronization operation. And what are those actions? Well, one of those actions is making sure that locally initiated writes have been propagated to other memories. In other words, assuring that all writes by the current processor have completed everywhere. And that's shown in this little diagram here where I show that P1's memory operations have to have reached all the other processors. That means they have to have been written to memory in such a way that those other processors, if they read the values of those memory locations, would retrieve the value that was written by P1. The other thing that needs to happen is that the local processor needs to have seen all previous writes anywhere in the system. So any writes to shared locations that have been performed by P2, P3, dot, 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 PN have to be visible to P1 when that synchronization operation finishes. That's a lot of work, and the work is not really necessary based upon what we're doing with a critical section, entering it or exiting it. So release consistency provides two operations. It provides acquire operations that you use when you're about to enter a critical section, and release operations, which you use when you're going to leave a critical section. Another difference from weak ordering is that it's possible to have different synchronization variables and you can acquire one or release one without having to have the synchronization operation be global. So you can have different critical sections in progress at the same time. Now when an acquire occurs, the memory has to make sure that all of the writes that have been written to shared memory anywhere in the system are visible to this process. So the process, when it gets into a critical section, has to be using updated values of all variables. So that means that when an acquire occurs, this has to be the case, the second diagram that I showed there. The memory will make sure that all local copies of shared variables are brought up to date. And when a release occurs, the opposite has to occur, namely that any changes to shared variables that have been made by this process need to be visible to the world, to the whole system. On the other hand, you don't have to have the converse be true. Doing an acquire does not guarantee that locally made changes will be propagated out immediately. So changes that are made by the local process don't have to be seen everywhere before you can do an acquire. And uh, conversely, doing a release does not necessarily import changes from other processors. So other processors may have made changes that are not visible to the local processor until some time after the release completes. Let's take a look at a diagram of how this works. And here we have uh, two new operations. A stands for acquire, and we can't use R for release because that means read, so we'll use Q for release, which the mnemonic value of is, is the word quit. Now process one, uh, this is the same situation we saw before, where there's a synchronization, and process one writes the value of one to x, and writes the value of two to x, and then uh, does a synchronization, in this case leaves the critical section. So you see that process 1 has updated the value of x to be 1 and then 2 inside the critical section. Process 2 uh, acquires the critical section and then it reads the value of x, which must be 2 because it's acquired, you know, it's because it's inside the critical section, so it's got to see the changes that have been made to x from the outside and then it leaves the critical section. P3, on the other hand, doesn't even bother to do that. It just goes ahead and reads the value of x. And because it hasn't done anything to make sure that it's synchronized, it can see an old value of x. The definition of release consistency, then, is that a system is release consistent if it obeys three rules. First, before an ordinary access to a shared variable is performed, all previous acquires done by the process must have completed. So that means that before you start accessing variables as in a critical section, you all, the acquire that got you into the critical section needs to have completed. Before a release is allowed to be performed, all previous reads and writes done by the process must have completed. So that says that you've got to make sure that 
all of the accesses to those variables that were done inside the critical section are seen everywhere before you're allowed to execute the release. And finally, the acquire and release accesses must be processor consistent. So see the difference? They don't have to be sequentially consistent, but just processor consistent. And that's why with release consistency, we can have different critical sections in progress at the same time. If these conditions are met and the processes use acquire and release properly, the result of an execution will be the same as on a sequentially consistent memory. That is, assuming that you use critical sections properly to uh, make sure that critical shared variables are changed only within the critical section. So let's take a look at what we've seen today. Sequential consistency is just infeasible in large multiprocessors, so we need to relax it. And the first way we can relax it is by using causal consistency, where only causally related shared accesses need to be seen in order throughout the system. The next way we can relax it is using processor consistency, where writes by an individual processor need to be seen in order throughout the system, but writes from different processors can be seen in arbitrary order. So the interleaving that we had when we have sequential consistency that needs to be seen in the same way throughout the system, the interleaving can be different at different processors in processor consistency. And then there are a couple of consistency models that require certain memory operations to be tagged as synchronization operations. The first is weak ordering where shared data can be counted on to be consistent after a synchronization takes place and release consistency, where shared data are made consistent when a region is, critical region is exited. And so you've got different operations to acquire and release, and each one of them does half of what a synchronization operation does in weak ordering. And for the very last thing we're going to look at, here's a diagram of what happens with the different consistency models. For sequential consistency, you see reads and writes follow in order in the orderings throughout the system. With processor consistency, they follow in order, but there's a possibility that there can be some concurrency there, some things that you can't determine whether they happened before or afterwards. I say, when I say some things you can't determine whether they happened before or afterwards, I mean some, some operations to shared memory where you can't determine which happened first because a different one appears to happen first at a different processor. Then with weak ordering, you have a set of memory accesses followed by a synchronization and a set of another memory accesses followed by a synchronization. And with release consistency, you have acquires and releases, but notice that you can have different critical sections in progress at the same time. So you can have different regions that are entered and exited, and they don't need to occur sequentially. You can have different critical regions that are active at the same time.